Are you suffering from holes in your base or weak base response despite the fact you have large hulking towers in your room? I might have the solution for you. That's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delicello with Audioholics. I want to help you guys out with your bass problems. We've all been there. We've all had it. Bass is really tricky to get right in small room acoustics. And even if you have the best speakers and, and the best seats and the best acoustic treatments in your room, there's still challenges to get things right, to get the bass integrated with all your subwoofers and to also get seat to seat consistency. Well, there's one acoustic phenomenon that plagues a lot of people that run towers in a system without added subwoofers, and it's called speaker boundary interference response. I want to discuss this with you. I want to tell you what it is all about and how we can calculate it and how we can improve the response of your speakers, whether you're running full range towers or you're using subwoofers in a subwoofer satellite kind of system. So I put together a really small presentation here I want to go over with you. Speaker boundary interference response. This occurs when the reflections from nearby boundaries interfere with the direct sound, causes frequency anomalies, especially in low frequencies. Now, I threw up a general rule formula here. You could call it FSBIR if you want. I just called it FC just to make it quick. But anyway, FC is equal to C divided by four times D, where C is the speed of sound in air which in this case is 1,125 feet per second. And D is the distance from the front wall to your speakers. And I do that in feet as well. That way you could calculate the SBIR frequency. You could see here I'm measuring my SVTRS system, the RBH system, using a tape measure and using the laser pointer as well. My speakers are roughly three and a half feet off the front wall. And as a result, I have a big bass dip in the 80 to 100 hertz rain. And I want to show you guys how I was able to fix this problem with a multitude of solutions. So just to give a recap of my system, in case anyone's not familiar, I like bass. I'm a bassaholic. This is my RBH SVTRS active speaker system. It has four 12 inch subwoofers per tower. So you get eight 12s just from the front speakers. And of course I've got my 21 inch sub from RBH, the infrasonic sub. This is what really, um, gets down to the single digit frequency response here. And I've got two other 12, 12 subs behind me. So I've got five subs in my system to get everything to sound right. Now you would think a system like this should have great bass response and it does, but it took me a lot to get there. And I had to really play around with room acoustics, speaker positioning, chair positioning, getting subwoofers integrated, and of course, EQ. All right, so there's really four ways that you could fix this problem. One would be repositioning the speakers. So if you have a dip in a problematic area that's, that you're noticing, if you move the speakers away from that front wall, that dip frequency goes lower. So if you have speakers that are only rated down to 40 hertz, get that speaker out into the room so that dip occurs at or below its where the speaker starts rolling off anyway. So that's one option that you could do. And of course, if you want to completely in eliminate the speaker boundary interference issue, you push the speakers all the way up against the front wall. Now they're in an infinite baffle. So if you have an in-wall speaker, like a flush mount product, it's in an infinite baffle. There's no speaker boundary interference issue anymore. That's one advantage that in-wall or flush mount speakers have. So work with your speaker position and to see if that's one way that you can resolve some of this. The next would be adding subwoofers. And in this case, you would put the subwoofers behind those speakers. You'd put them usually in the corners or just up against that wall. And then you don't have to worry about the speaker boundary interference, just like I was talking about with the flush mount speakers. At that point, you could either base manage your main speakers or you could adjust the speaker position so that that dip frequency is in the subwoofer region hopefully not right at the crossover point, but in the subwoofer region, definitely not above it. If you have subwoofer region set to 80 Hertz, you don't want that dip frequency at 150 Hertz because the subwoofers aren't going to help. So bring those speakers away from that front wall in that case, get that dip frequency at or below the subwoofer crossover point. 
So that's the next solution. Another one would be if you're not running subwoofers in the system, you're just running towers, you're going to have to put pretty hefty bass trapping behind those speakers on the front wall. You're going to need something, you know, anywhere from seven to eight inches thick of fiberglass with a two inch offset or just very specific bass traps that will work down into those frequencies. And as a frequency dip is lower, obviously the acoustic treatments need to be bigger. So that becomes impractical. It becomes ugly. That's why I really recommend the multi-sub kind of approach, getting subwoofers up there. But the last but not least, I want to show uh, what I did in my system. I'm fortunate to have a fully active speaker system that has a Marani DSP. It's a commercial grade DSP. It's got FIR room correction in it. And it also has PEQ functionality, shelving filters, anything you, you can think of in the digital domain this thing does. But one thing it has that most products don't is all-pass filters. So what is an all-pass filter? An all-pass filter is one there, the frequencies that pass through it unchanged in amplitude response, but it alters the phase of that signal without affecting its magnitude. So the bottom line is if you have a problem in a certain frequency range, let's say 80 to 100 hertz, you put an all-pass filter on one of the speakers in that range and you adjust to where that problem is. And you're going to see what happens when I demonstrate that to you because, again, I'm changing the phase relationship of the speaker. I'm not actually changing the magnitude response. So the way the speaker is playing into the room acoustically loads differently. But subjectively speaking, how does how can you improve bass response with all pass filters? It corrects phase misalignments between subwoofers and main speakers. I've actually used them to get my subwoofers integrated, my 21 inch subwoofer integrated with the rest of the system. I needed to use an all pass filter in that case. Um, it enhances low frequency clarity and impact. It reduces cancellations or reinforcement issues and crossover points and provides tighter, more accurate bass reproductions. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now to show you the measurements in my system and how the all-pass filter helped in specific seat locations. All right. So here is the bass response of just my main left and right speakers without any of the other subwoofers in the room. You can see it's really good. I mean, it's very linear. I've got good bass extension down below 18 hertz and then it rolls off. But there's a huge suck out here when the front left and right speakers are playing together and it's from 80 hertz to 100 hertz. That's really big. That's 20, over 20 hertz wide. That's very audibly um, problematic if the bass notes hit in that area. So this is without any all pass filter. When I add an all pass filter on one of my subs, either the left speaker or the right speaker, bam. I made a huge improvement here. In fact, if you look at the magnitude of it, it went from 71, 72 dB there, that dip, back to 83 dB. That's almost 12 dB improvement. That's definitely audible and it's definitely beneficial. But what I always stress to you guys is when you're doing measurements of a system, you don't just look at one point. I see a lot of people online when they post their base graphs, they post them with just one single point, one position in the room, highly smooth, and it just looks like a straight line, like it looks perfect. That's just not how things work. I want to show you multiple points here. So here is a different point at C2. That's with no all-pass filter. You see the dip is there. Then you add the all-pass filter and bam, that response is improved again. Take another position here. This is with no all-pass filter. So this is in front of the seat. So if your head is more forward, bam, look at the difference. The dip is even worse without that all-pass filter. So that really improved things. And then I checked the uh, position where my wife sits, which is seat three. So now I have two rows, seven seats. The front three seats um, centered are the most important in the room. And I want to make sure I get those right. So here's C3 where my wife sits and without the all pass. And here it is with the all pass. And again, it made a huge, huge effect here in a positive way from 69 dB all the way to 81. That's a big swing. I don't want my wife to be missing out on that great little bass that she likes, whether it's listening to Latin music, jazz, whatever. I don't want any holes in her bass response. So that was improved there. Now you look at the seat one, which is to the left of me with no all pass versus an all pass. This one didn't benefit quite as much. It was a little bit benefit here, but definitely the acoustical loading in that area was a little different. 
And when you get to the back row, this is where we're in a maximum pressure area. And I didn't have that SBIR issue. Definitely not as bad as I had uh, at the front row. This is what all the subwoofers playing, by the way. I don't know why I don't have the measurements without that. but And then that's with the all-pass filter. So it's pretty much similar. And I want to show you what my response looks like at the money seat with all the subs playing. And this is great. I mean, this is there's still a little bit of a suck out here, but it's, you know, only within from 84 to 81. It's a three or four dB suck out. That's not the end of the world. And you can see I have a very nice target curve here with excellent bass response down to the single digits. In fact, I'm using the U-Mic 1, so it, the noise floor on the U-Mic 1s isn't great below 20 hertz. When I got an actual calibrated mic that was accurate down to five hertz, there was about two or three dB more output here below 20 hertz. So I actually have more bass than this graph is showing. Definitely have enough bass in this room to be a true bassaholic. And with that all pass filter added, it really helped uh, to get to minimize the suck out that I was having before. Having multi sub was a game changer to keep everything consistent from seat to seat. And I did the best I could acoustically. I couldn't really put super thick uh, padding behind the speakers. I have maybe, I think my panels are four inch, they're good acoustics. It just didn't help uh, that effectively in that range. So guys, bottom line, uh, reposition your speakers as you can, use bass management, put the subwoofers up against the front wall to resolve SBIR issues if that's a problem in your room. You could use your speakers, again, bass managed with those subs. Some acoustics can help, but they're big and bulky, so that might not be the best solution. And then, of course, if you have the ability to do active equalization like I did, you can usually manipulate some of this within certain frequencies. And it could benefit some of your seats, but not necessarily all of your seats. So if you like this topic and you want to hear more about bass tweaks or how to get better bass response in your room, Give me some comments down below. Comments are gold. We want to hear from you. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the thumb up. And if you like this, please support our Patreon at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.